G'day, Dylan from the Byron Bay Observatory here. Are you into taking photos of space but don't have the budget or the patience to build out a whole big observatory to impress your Tinder dates? Well, have I got the video for you. Today, we are saying no to big budget blockbusters and yes to small, versatile, and most importantly, automatable setups like this one. Because size doesn't matter. Right, Jessica? That's right. It's not the size that matters much, what you do with it. And wait till you see what I can do with this. Check this out, a little bit of gear porn here. We have the Skywatcher Evolux 82ED, about 500 and something millimeter focal length with the reducer. We've got the QHY 247C, which is the color camera, so one shot color, easy. But most importantly, we have the Skywatcher Star Adventurer GTI, which is the one that is fully ASCOM compliant. So you can connect a hand controller or a computer to this thing, and you can automate the hell out of it. In fact, I'm running the exact same setup as I used to run my entire observatory on this cheap little mount, and it does it all. I'm gonna be guiding with the EvoGuide 50ED, which is Honestly, overkill for a guide scope. Who needs helical focusing on a guide scope? I don't know. But I am using the new QHY 53715C guide camera that uh, QHY sent me to test. I've already done some testing, it's working great. And we're gonna go out tonight and do some more. This is the standard tripod that comes with the Star Adventurer. However, I do have the little pier extension here as well. It's pretty straightforward, but you can chuck all sorts of very capable stuff on here, even a DSLR camera with a long lens, and guide with it and get deep space photos. The costings for all of this are here. It's a little bit over four and a half grand US to set up something like this, but I reckon you could save a lot of money by skimping on things like the guide scope and the scope itself and even the camera, super overkill. But it's a pretty nice rig. I'd love to see the day where I could just pick this up, stick it in my Cybertruck, completely assembled, go to a star party, open the back up, and just image. That's the dream. Anyway, my name is Dylan O'Donnell. You're watching Star Stuff. I'm pretty lazy, so I want this setup to be as easy as possible. I'm going all the way a few meters into my deck. That's done. So last time I did this, uh, the first test where I got a 20 minute shot of Karina, which wasn't bad, I used this extension cord and got wet in the rain. It was one of those sudden tropical rain showers and uh, this shorted out half the house and blew up my studio monitors and I had to do some fuse replacement and soldering. Got it all back up and running again. So I'm, it's working again, but I'm not gonna use this tonight. Now for rough polar alarm, I'm just gonna use sky guide set to fast forwards so I can see where the South Celestial Pole is. Pretty well on it, but I'll do a three point polar alignment later. You know who won't shame you for having a teeny tiny little baby telescope is Bintel. Bintel will actually sell you this telescope. In fact, they'll sell you anything in this video because they are an Australian vendor based out of Sydney and they have a great range of stuff. And I've been working with them for years. I've got a lot of my gear, my telescopes, cameras, and accessories from Bintel. Uh, you'll notice that the difference between them and other Australian vendors is they actually know what they're doing. So check them out, www.bintel.com.au. Okay, I'm in the backyard. I've got Nina configured with all the camera parameters, the telescope, and everything's connected to ASCOM, exactly as it would be in my observatory. Uh, now I'm trying to slew and center, so I'm using the framing wizard to uh, just get into 
the area of Carina so I can determine the rotation of the camera and then frame the object nicely. I was getting the ASCOM driver errors trying to sync the coordinates and I think it was because I was so far out of polar alignment. I hadn't done any polar alignment at this point, it was just roughed in. Uh, but it did find Carina and it did go there by itself just like my observatory does. And this is this tiny little scope in the backyard. Uh, so once it's in I was able to determine the camera rotation uh, which is just this little button down here and that just takes another photo of the sky and lets you know the rotation. And of course that lets you frame it up the way you want. Then I added it to the simple sequencer and I was about ready to do the three point polar align, which if you haven't seen, you really need to get a handle on, especially for portable. But I'll be honest, I had to run this many, many times. My rough wasn't so good. So I ran this over and over again until it got it right. And also if you don't have access to uh, all of the sky, you should put it into manual mode. And basically it just, moves around itself, plate solves itself, takes a bunch of pictures and then will just show you the error. Then you just move left or right or up and down as it tells you until you can get these numbers down to, well, as close to zero as possible. And when you see that little box at the end, you know you're pretty good to go. I pointed my telescope at the sky for 37,000 hours. I mean, min no, 37 minutes, 37 minutes, and this is what I saw. Absolutely glorious. Nah, I'm just janking your chain. We've got to actually process this image, so this is what I did. First, it's one shot color, so you have to debayer the images and your darks as well, and then apply them in image calibration. I didn't use any flats or anything, then I did a star alignment and blinked the images so that I could look for UFOs and asteroids and delete all the stuff that I don't want, all the bad frames where I bumped something. Uh, then do the image integration, the actual stacking, then the drizzle integration because we, we did do that and we are going to drizzle and it's going to be bigger. And then I run my color calibration and then background neutralization, then a little bit of SCNR because we know it's going to be a little green biased. And guess what we do next? So, what do you think? Not a bad result for a little portable rig that's just sitting on my deck in the backyard for 37 minutes. I'm pretty happy with that. There is minimal processing on this. I haven't done really any star reduction or noise reduction. Uh, the, the corners of this image look fantastic. The, the field flattener actually does what it says and it flattens it quite nicely. The camera did a fantastic job and is really doing most of the heavy lifting here. Uh, there is a little bit of chromatic aberration on the stars, uh, which is due in part to the doublet construction of the telescope. Uh, but again, this is a real downgrade from my observatory. Now this sort of a setup, because it is one shot color, you really do need a dark sight. And it works best on those big bright targets, things like Andromeda, Carina, Orion, that sort of stuff. And it is versatile. I can swap this telescope out with anything else. The Star Adventure is a pretty capable little mount. There is a little bit of error and it is hard to dial in those polar alignment things at really 100% accuracy. However, at this kind of wide focal length, um, it's really quite forgiving. So you can have a bit of error. There's a lot of tolerance in there. Your stars will still look sharp. The image will still look great. I did run a little bit of Blur X, but hey, it's a little portable, cheap and cheerful, happy setup. What are you gonna do? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Episode. Thanks for tagging me in your photos. I love seeing your work and I hope your astrophotography journey is going well. My name is Dylan O'Donnell. You've been watching Star Stuff and remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. Mm -hmm.